we have <coughs> relation to the genome system and identity this kind of conceptual conflict uh, the UN has declared the human genome as human heritage so it's something we all share like the ocean bed is also human heritage we refer to the genome as relational identity I mean in terms of family relationship it was mentioned in one of the talks earlier to find out my ancestors or paternity so <coughs> it cannot be I mean the ocean bed has nothing relational or familial and we also take the genome as one own personal private code or marker and these three roles in many ways contradict each other and many of our ethical problems are, are derived from conceptual problems metaphysical issues that try to a little bit work on <coughs> in this talk so Galen uh, is not much in the curriculum today <coughs> but he's still important he started with these distinctions he said they are they are naturals I mean things about human nature like having two legs and so forth there are the constitutionals so <coughs> as we heard before some people have ep epilepsy or a tendency to <coughs> to be overweight so this is something that is particular to the constitution of the person it's the way you were born what roughly we say today it's, it's in my DNA it's not just that I'm a human being and there are the environmental factors as we call today the non-naturals what Gallon called so he has this division this food and, food and drink and exercise so if I overeat and I do not exercise I may be overweight with low physical endurance regardless of my constitution so in a way it's who I am at least now or for major part of my life but it's my non-natural I because it's not in my constitution it's not in, <coughs> in my human nature and the contra-naturals we are not going to discuss now these are things that are offensive to all humans like poison so <coughs> Galen like medical systems they like classifying pe people by combinations of basic units this could be Chinese medicine Tibetan medicine and also the genetic code <coughs> and before we go into it we have to remember that the issue of privacy is neither in our constitution not in our human nature the part of privacy that is most important to us so at least I argue is biographical privacy the letters we write the, the things we create as agents <coughs> and one of our privacy is the way we control our own image in society what we publish or post online or what we write in a private letter and this is something of concern and many of the issues regarding genetic information touches this point that once we are worried that if certain genetic information is disclosed my image in society might change without my control over that image <coughs> but going back now to the issue of data and privacy we have also to distinguish between two different problems if we refer to professor bin hack talk that goes with the life cycle of data there could be other models there's a model i like that has four elements here are two there's exposure so my data or medical records might be exposed because the cloud is not well protected or hackers may get into it <coughs> um, but it doesn't mean that anybody bothers that anybody knows this is exposure sometime uh, <coughs> and there is intrusion that there is somebody with a deliberate intent of finding out something about me and these things are not the same and exposure is a very different kind of privacy violation 
if at all. Yeah, it's a little <coughs> similar to the panopticon. There is surveillance that I did not put here, and there is a, a predetermination that we'll touch later on. So, who is me and what is information if we go back not to Chinese medicine or Tibetan medicine, but to individuation and specification, and in what way genomics has changed the picture in a qualitative way? So, first of all, there is individuation. Individuation is like fingerprint, is a way to pinpoint a person out of others, and that's it. My fingerprint, arguably, is unique to me, but it carries no information about me. It's arbitrary. The only information you get from a fingerprint that it's me. And you can think of all sorts of accidental and other combinations by which you can tell this is the person and no other. <coughs> and there's specification that we have a body of information we decipher it somehow, and then we identify a person relative to the body of information, and this is like constructing a family tree. So genomics is at least a way, you can use it only for individuation, there are ways of doing it, but the technology is there that you usually put the person in context, ethnic or familiar, depends what you can say. So here, you get information about the individual, <coughs> beyond the individuation. So what is this information? Now we had an older model of hope, that one mutation, one condition, or one genetic marker, mark person. But this is very rare. We hear again and again the Huntington, Korea, we heard about certain kind of rare diseases. But for most conditions we care about, there is no one or two dominant genetic markers. And we know from a genome association studies that genetic information is a collection of mutations. Each has a very tiny impact on the person. So what we get is like profiling. This is a profile of a person, a real person, that puts his percentile for having certain uh, mental issues. So he ranks 22 percentile, low risk, relative to others. It doesn't mean that you have 22 percent chances of having bipolar disorders. But if you take all of humanity and go by percentiles in terms of risk, he ranks 22%, 22nd percent, and means 88% of the population have a high risk for bipolar disorder than this person, and 94 percentile for educational attainment. And as we'll see <coughs> later on, once we do this whole genome testing and we get this profiling, what do you do and what these kind of information tells you. First of all, it tells about chances relative to others. It doesn't tell you anything about what the person has. It certainly doesn't tell us what the person is. So, <coughs> often we think a genetic information is specifying something, but often it only individuates. It might be the only person in the world with this collection of percentiles, or you may, we may add other uh, conditions that are genetic or partially genetic, and, and of all mental health issues, around 50% genetic influence the other in the environment, and tell this is the unique uh, oracle of a person, that he has this set of relative risks, but what we do with this? And we have to remember that the statistical significance is not that much significant because if we go, this is from <coughs> the twin studies, they show here those are the lowest 10th percentile for height. Height is considered highly determined genetically and the 10th uppermost percentile for height, there is much, much, much overlap 
So things that are statistically significant and we care for them for academic promotion and thank God there are many, they are often not realistically significant by any specific human goal. So if <coughs> you plan a healthcare service for a nation, these numbers are important because when you plan mental health for nine million people, you know how many beds or services you might need for certain kind of patients. But when you go to individual people, <coughs> it means almost nothing <coughs> by any sense that we regard information so far. And then we go on to the microbiome, all the germs living around us. And there are studies showing that uh, feeding methods, for example, it's one example, influence infants' microbiome. So what mothers do, whether they use a bottle or breastfeed or breast milk pumps, already influences the microbiome of the baby. And this is really important because we will see that the microbiome is associated with many, many conditions, no less than our genome. And from system biology, you look in systems within systems within systems, so you can talk about the holobiont, which is the human being with all the animals living. I mean, my late grandmother is not alive to know how many germs live. <laughs> that, <coughs> that would be disastrous. And the concept of a hologenome, so these uh, 23, 46 chromosomes, uh, and, and we add the mitochondrial, but who cares? There's so much genetic material that is relevant on our system as a holobiont or hologenome because we, there is no single human being walking around without the microbiome. So we can take the microbiome as a marker of individuation. A few months ago I saw a study coming from Hong Kong showing differences in the microbiome on the skin from people traveling different lines in the Hong Kong underground. So at least, uh, we don't know whether it has any health, health impact, but a way to individuate people. It could be information on risk, we'll see, so it, it is, and it's also a relational marker because it's also something that goes with the families and, and, and we have all similar problems. Like we go to Helicobacter pylori, that is a serious risk factor for gastric cancer and, gastric and, and peptic ulcer, and it's similar to the notion of one gene, one disease. So some genes are very significant determination for disease, so some germs on the body have a, a similar relative power to other germs. And indeed, <coughs> there's a whole list of conditions linked to microbiome. And this list surprises nobody because we know this list already from genetic studies. All these diseases also are influenced by uh, ordinary uh, gen uh, genetic studies. So what are we doing with all this information <coughs> about problems to come? So we go to the basics of evolutionary theory <coughs> and system biology and basically there are four strategies of coping for all living beings. One is to accept, that's it. Second is to escape. If there is a danger, I run away. <coughs> Third is change of environment. I mean, <coughs> it's too cold, I might freeze, so I lit a fire and it's warm. And change self. Take medicine, uh, do some intervention in my own self. And in evolution, ev all, all of these occur. I mean, there is acceptance. In the whole theory, for example, about sloth, these animals that do nothing, we think they do nothing, they call sloth. That, I mean, if they manage to survive so far, I mean, they, they don't need to worry about, you know, idleness. <laughs> Escape, migration, uh, we see change environment is something that, that elephants do. Many animals are proven to change their own environment. It's the definition in system biology that at least 
the immediate environment is manipulated by the system and change self either gradually <coughs> this is the evolutional process or deliberately and we can think about it in terms of the body holobiont about primary relations what is the system we refer to the immigration of the family immigration of a single person changes uh, in society this is something we often forget that many many ills will get better by social change um, we just had election in israel and we have decided society to change many things in our politics how we expect great changes coming <coughs> and an aspect of this is the vertical transmission so we have a uh, discuss the CRISPR and gene editing and microbiome engineering is something that is discussed extensively in the literature mostly on plants because it is the ethical gradient things you don't speak of in relation to humans you talk more in relation to mouse animals but there is no um, you don't need any IRB or similar body of process to experiments on plants so if you go to the plant literature it's not that I know much about plant I know what to search you found <coughs> manipulation of the microbiome that may improve or change plants but also uh, when we immigrate we also impact our children a lot all modes of coping has some impact on the next generation that is the vertical transmission even acceptance if we accept certain conditions or certain ways of life um, we make a choice for our children or may not wish and then we take a more specific example when you go to epidemics tuberculosis or AIDS so again run away that is the number one course of action uh, especially favored by physicians it was always the first to escape the cities in the pre-modern period so <clears throat> to the countryside you can change the environment is to do malaria related projects of public health and now the most controversial intervening uh, that came out this Chinese scientist who claims to have uh, modified the CRISPR that a future child, future, a few children actually, uh, would be immune to HIV. And for some reasons that we should ask ourselves why, we consider this particular intervention as more ethically loaded, some say genetic exceptionalism, than others, like change of our whole environment or immigration or other choices and there are inter interferences that already exist and we have to reflect how to classify them like attenuated vaccines <coughs> we take uh, pathogens we turn them in a way to part of our healthy microbiome by means of genetic modification indirect with a passageway i mean you you, you before i mean this system these methods of producing attenuated brushing had existed before humanity knew about the double helix but basically it's the same thing you create mutations gradually gradually create mutations that you bring back to humans after having grown them in monkeys or other animals and they infect the humans trigger immune response not a genetic change but you would ask yourself what the big difference might be and you introduce it to children to babies i mean with a polio <coughs> so we have to first of all realize the mismatch between biological and individuation on well-being we have to remember the single factors that are me are minor there are very few genetic traits or defects that have significant impact on one's health 
So you may identify, uh, I will let you guess this if you remember, if you go back in the slides, this person with his dad, so I say, who he or she is. A prisoner, a mental patient, somebody from your TB study, a university professor. We have this temptation. We think we know a lot and the privacy of the person is exposed, but actually it's an illusion of knowledge. Single factors in me might be greater, like the microbiome or other biomarkers, the way of Galen looking at you, your weight, your color. And we often forget that external factors may have the greatest impact. It's the ABC of contemporary epidemiology, the fundamentals uh, cause theory of disease socioeconomic status and when we hear this splendid talk about tuberculosis and genetic markers one serious ethical focus issue is that we focus on the markers but the fact that some people are prisoners or they come from poor countries or for situations of starvation or oppression is the real issue here. So we have in our society a kind of ethos that is born very well by this a com genetic company named highly successful 23andMe that is, is not clear. What does it mean 23 me? I mean, the hardline geneticists say 23 is me. But there's, who is this me? So system and the emergence of the conscious person is the number one question because the ABC of system biology is the emergence element when you step up the level. So I may be a holobiont, the 23 and plus and plus and plus, and we are conscious persons that emerge. And this conscious person has moral individual identity he or she is a locus of rights and responsibilities and of autobiographical or biographical privacy that I touched. The locus is anchored in social relations and in human identity, no less than in a particular body with particular markers. But in our society, nevertheless, and this is a kind of contradiction, the change of the person is always more significant morally, they change to environment and to immigration, to running away. And this is something that we should question very well. If I do something to myself or to my children, I take drugs for depression, I change a certain gene, take vaccination against uh, HPV, and I'm a sex, work sex worker, it's bioethics to discuss. But the real issue might be change environment that allow this kind of employment or just living it. The local shifting modes of coping means direct interaction with a stressor of moral values as well. But we still cherish changes to the self, to our constitution. We are still Galenic. Even though there has been a paradigm shift. Not that Galen is outmoded, because Galen thought there is constitution and naturals. And what we see, there is a continuity of the DNA, continuity of risk, to continuity of systems. So we have moral risks here, because the, metaphysic, the metaphysical issues are interesting philosophically. At the level available, there's diminishment of self relative to risk data. We often protect and care more about risk data relative to our biographical self, or we think only of the risk data. 
further diminishment of self relative to risk data of me. What is in my genes is considered to be more important. Because when further diminishment of risk arrives before the self matures. This is a very serious risk regarding Professor Ravitsky's talk. Because the person who undertook this genetic panels did it when he was in his 50s. He's a professor of genetics. I can tell you this. So the, uh, he's first a person managing to have his own biographical identity and then comes up this data and you might say, wow, what it means. But the day this information comes as stigma or something to be pride of, whatever, on a person. But when we test an embryo, what comes first is the statistics of risk. Before the child has managed to have any personal or biographical identity. And a very serious risk that comes from this information, I said there are four patterns, is predetermination. That the parent sees this, and the child might see this, and the life is already predetermined by these risk issues. First, I don't know how you do it. Second, we are at risk of seeing what geneticists can tell. So suppose they tell this, so all they think, well, 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 we send him to university, or maybe we invest better with a brother that is less brilliant, but not likely to be schizophrenic. But what's missing here might be information about risk for sudden death, diabetes, many, many, many other factors. So we happen to know a few things, like risk for epilepsy, or there's epilepsy running in the family, but there are so many other things. So even if we wish to design people's future by this kind of data, we need so much more in order to be right. It just happen to have these panels done. So predetermination is a very, very serious issue. It's going really to the Galenic times that we go, when, when, when we are pregnant with a child and don't know what, what we're going to do. It's written in the Bible. You go to the oracle, and the oracle tells you the future. You might kill your father, and, uh, and it's going back to Greek tragedy and, uh, tragedy, and our society is at risk of reaching this, this point. A priori preferences to protection of me data over known me. This is a good question, whether we consider this genetic professionalism, uh, exceptionalism, is morally justified. And these are the key issues we have to deal with, I think. First of all, confusing who I might likely become with who I am and who should I be. It's a big issue. The Talmud says that one mother got, I mean, the th soothsayers told her that her child would be a bandit. So she didn't go to Vardala uh, Sakaterayon to ask the termination of pregnancy. She went to a rabbi, and the rabbi told him, cover his head, give the kippah on his head, and he uh, will see, will feel the presence of God. He became to be a pious rabbi. So if we act by the risk, it's not that he, the rabbi didn't tell her that these soothsayers say, say nothing, or they breach the right to privacy. Put in other words, when realism becomes determinism, I mean, I do not wish to be the scientist and say this data might be bullshit, this might be, yeah, but okay, I accept all this risk, but it's not real. This real is, it's a risk is realistic. And when risk data becomes normative information, and we have to ask ourselves how much our own regulation and talk about the need of protection, whatever, might be justified, but the side effect was this inflation of moral significance and regulating biological influences on our children next generation at the expense of social and environmental influences. We want to do something good to protect the next generation, we stop CRISPR. Maybe. I didn't say anything for CRISPR, 
but there are so many more things for humanity to think of in the benefit of uh, future children. Thank you very much.